Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to our 11th lecture. Uh, and in this lecture, we're going to start uh, a new unit. And that unit is on the senses. And this unit will consist of three different parts. Uh, in this one, we'll talk mainly about uh, sensory systems in general, uh, so properties that are common to our different senses. Uh, and then we'll go into one particular sense as sort of an example, uh, our somatosensory sense, what we often call our sense of touch. Uh, though we'll see that sense of touch uh, actually includes a number of different receptor types, uh, different sensory organs, and in different kinds of stimuli that we process. Uh, we bundle it all into our sense of touch, uh, but there are some components there that we probably take for granted or don't think about at all. Uh, so that will be today, and then uh, I'll lay down sort of a roadmap for what this unit consists of. Uh, but what we're going to start doing is applying the knowledge that we've already gained uh, when it comes to things like neurons, uh, the structure and function of neurons, the organization of the nervous system. Uh, so we had those units, and up until now, they've existed in, in sort of a vacuum. Uh, we haven't been able to apply that knowledge yet, but now uh, we're going to start applying it. So we'll see why we learned all of that uh, and how our psychological experience really depends uh, on the structure and function of the nervous system. Uh, so we're learning about the senses for the next couple of lectures. Uh, and we have different kinds. Everyone knows that. Uh, we often say that we have five senses. As we'll see, we have more than that. Uh, and we'll talk about sensation and perception. Uh, so sensation, strictly speaking, uh, is the stimulation of a sense organ. Uh, so when we say we feel something, what we actually mean is perception. We perceive a stimulus. And our perceptions are not always accurate. Uh, our nervous system is certainly not perfect, uh, but also it takes little shortcuts. So as we go through these units, we'll see different ways in which our senses can be inaccurate, uh, and that leads to our perceptions being inaccurate. Uh, as an example, we'll look at our sense of touch, uh, different components of touch, how it works, uh, and then how that system is organized. How do we get from the stimulation uh, of the skin to activity in the brain? And where in the brain is that activity? Uh, more specifically, we'll see that we have more than just those five classic senses. Uh, we have the ability to tell how our bodies are positioned. We have the ability to feel pain, uh, to feel temperature. And so maybe you bundle those things in with your sense of touch, but probably not. So we have more than just five senses. Uh, and we'll see how we get from environmental signals, energy or matter out in the environment, uh, to action potentials. And that's a process we call transduction. And depending on the sense, that happens in different ways. Uh, and so we'll see how we process touch, how we process temperature, uh, how these things get converted into action potentials. Uh, and we'll see that the nervous system adapts on a very short time scale, that we get used to a stimulus being there, uh, that your nervous system doesn't waste a lot of energy representing a stimulus that's always there, uh, that will, it sort of gets lazy, uh, and so it will stop responding to it. And, and you'll notice that psychologically, but you probably haven't given it much thought. Okay, uh, so again, we're gonna start with an overview of the senses. Uh, what is the point of having senses? So if we think way back to one of our earliest lectures, we recall the question, why do we have a brain? Uh, and the answer was that we can respond to the environment. Now, part of responding to the environment is moving around, making a choice, initiating an action. Uh, maybe that action is to gain a reward, to get something good. Maybe it's food. Uh, or maybe to avoid something bad, to avoid a potential predator, or to avoid an aversive environment where we might get injured. Uh, but the first step in that process is detecting what's out there. And that's what the senses do. They give us information about what is out there in our world. Uh, so they are the first step in that process. And of course, we have more complex psychological phenomena uh, than just senses and movement. Uh, we have things like memory, which is important for storing information to determine our next actions. Uh, we have things like attention, where we can process some stimuli more deeply than others. Uh, and so we'll get to those kind of things later. Uh, but for now, we're going to start with one of our most basic components, the senses. So again, 
Today, we'll look at the somatosensory system as an example, our sense of touch, uh, but also some other senses that you might not have thought about. Uh, next time, we'll move into our senses of hearing, taste, and smell. Uh, so we have all these senses. We know that. Uh, some are more sensitive than others, especially when we compare to other animals. Our sense of smell, not that great compared to a lot of animals. Sense of hearing is okay, but certainly not as good as that of a bat, for example. Uh, and then we'll spend a third lecture on vision. And vision, we have a lot of our brain devoted to. We depend on to a large degree. Uh, so vision is a very important sense for humans. Uh, and, and primates in general tend to lean heavily on their visual systems. So we'll talk about how vision works. Now here's a, a table, this is from your book, uh, that lists a bunch of our senses. And we'll talk about not all of these, but most of these. Uh, so we see our sense of touch up in the top row. Uh, we see, for example, pain, which we're not going to really get into in this course. Uh, but pain is an interesting phenomenon, it, and it's an, uh, a target of increasing study because of chronic pain, which is an increasing issue uh, in our society, and it's led to the, the existence of what we call the opioid crisis, uh, how we currently deal with chronic pain. Uh, we'll talk about hearing. Uh, we'll talk about not much about the vestibular uh, or how our brain senses the position of our body. Uh, though those are interesting as well. And, and all of those are listed under a subheading of mechanical senses here. And we'll see what we mean by that. When something actually moves one of our sense organs, whether it vibrates it or puts pressure on it, we call that a mechanical sense. Uh, and a lot of those get built in together here. So touch, pain, the position of your body. Uh, we have our visual sense, which is how we detect light. We have thermal senses for detecting heat and cold. Uh, we have chemical senses, our sense of smell, our sense of taste. Uh, we're detecting the presence of chemicals. Uh, and some animals, not us, uh, have an electrical sense where we can actually detect electrical fields. Again, humans cannot do this. So I'll talk briefly about that in a moment. Uh, so, for example, just pick out your thermal sense, which is one that you probably haven't thought much about. And again, maybe you build this into your sense of touch, uh, but strictly speaking, your sense of touch is about pressure and vibration. It's the mechanical movement of your skin. Uh, your skin can be perfectly motionless, and you can still detect the temperature of something. Uh, so you can detect whether something is hot or cold. That is a separate sense. It is not part uh, of what we think of as the typical five senses. Uh, the vomeronasal sense. If you've ever heard of pheromones, that is what the vomeronasal sense senses. And it is in a matter of ongoing debate whether humans have a vomeronasal sense. Uh, the organ that in most animals, in most mammals, uh, detects pheromones seems to be dormant in humans. But there may be a way around that. We may detect pheromones with our usual sense of smell, even if we're not aware of it. Uh, but we see a, an animal here using its vomeronasal sense. More on that later when we get to our sense of smell. Uh, but other animals are highly sensitive to pheromones, have specific behaviors that are triggered by pheromones. Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit about the vomeronasal sense. We're not going to spend much time on it because it doesn't have a big impact on humans. Uh, again, the organ that seems to detect pheromones in most animals is dormant in us. Uh, but we may be able to detect pheromones at some level. Uh, electroreception uh, is used heavily by animals like sharks. We can't do it. We can't detect electrical fields. But sharks, for example, uh, don't need to be able to see their prey or smell it. They can detect its movements and then the activity in its nervous system because of that activity's impact on local electric fields. So a shark can detect prey by the electric field that it gives off. Uh, and there are other animals as well that use electric fields to detect the environment, detect, for example, the bottom of the ocean. Uh, and these animals are almost all fish uh, because salt water is a great medium for conducting electrical fields. Air doesn't really do it, so other animals don't detect electrical fields if they're 
land animals. Uh, but many fish can, uh, and they can use it to detect other members of their species, use it to detect obstacles, uh, use it to detect prey. So humans don't have this sense, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but that is a sense that some animals have. So we're going to go back to ion channels, and we talked about ion channels a great deal in our unit on action potentials, in our unit on synaptic transmission, and we're now going to come back to that. So what activates an ion channel? What makes it open up and let ions in or out? So we've already seen that voltage can do it. So we've seen voltage-gated sodium channels. We've seen voltage-gated calcium channels like we see here. And just to remind you, these are ion channels uh, that let in their specific ions, sodium or calcium, depending on the membrane potential, depending on the difference in charge between the inside and the outside of the neuron. So we've seen this in a couple different contexts. The action potential becomes initiated by the opening of those voltage-gated sodium channels. They open up when the neuron is depolarized, they let in sodium, and that depolarization propagates down the axon. When it gets to the axon terminal, those voltage-gated calcium channels detect that difference in charge and open up and let in calcium, and that lets vesicles release neurotransmitter. So we've already seen that. We're familiar with that. But that's just one thing that opens up an ion channel. We've seen it in calcium channels. We've seen it in the action potential, in sodium channels that are voltage-gated, in potassium channels that are voltage-gated. We've also seen ligand-gated ion channels, those channels that open up when a neurotransmitter is present. It binds to the channel, causes that channel to open up and let in sodium, for example, or let in chloride if it's an inhibitory channel. So voltage can do it, neurotransmitters can do it, we've already seen this. But a sensory stimulus can do this as well, and depending on the sense, it can do that in different ways. Uh, so for example, a chemical can come along that isn't a neurotransmitter, but a chemical comes along, binds to a receptor, and if that receptor is an ion channel as well, it opens up and lets in sodium, for example. This is how we detect odors and certain tastes. If that chemical is present, it will bind to the receptor. That receptor will open up and let in ions, whatever ion that specific receptor is for. So this is how taste works in some cases. This is how smell works. Detecting the presence of a chemical, just like we do for a neurotransmitter. A light can do it. We'll get to that in our unit on vision. Uh, a ray of light, a photon, uh, can come in and hit a certain part of these receptor cells, and that causes ions to come in. We'll see how later. Uh, mechanical pressure can do it. And this is how our sense of touch works, also how our sense of hearing works, as we'll see. So these are just new kinds of energy or matter uh, that can cause an ion channel to open up. But that's going to be very important to understand for this unit. So we've already seen voltage opening up ion channels. We've seen neurotransmitters opening up ion channels. But now we have other kinds of chemicals. We have light particles. We have mechanical pressure opening up ion channels. So we have some new categories of things that can do this. And not all species are the same when it comes to senses. Uh, we have a concept that's called convergent evolution. So we see some different species here. All of these species have eyes. They can all detect light. Uh, many of them can detect color. Uh, but the eyes of these species are very different. And they've exhibited what's called convergent evolution. So all these different species need to be able to see, and their common ancestor might have had a rudimentary light receptor system. It could detect the difference between light and dark, uh, but the structure and shape and function of these eyes are very different. A fly's eye is what's called a compound eye. It's very different from the eye of a bird or a mammal. Uh, and so all of these eyes more or less evolved independently because of the animal need to navigate its spatial environment using light. Uh, so convergent evolution uh, occurs when different species have the same need, and so they develop a, a common structure or a common sense. 
not common sense in the terms of reasonable, but a sense that they have in common, a way of detecting the environment. And that organ may look very similar across those species, even though it developed independently. Uh, and as we know, we know from a sort of folk wisdom standpoint, uh, that different species have senses that are more or less acute than ours. Our sense of smell is not very good, especially compared to a dog. Uh, our sense of hearing is okay, uh, but for example, from this diagram, uh, cats can hear higher frequencies than we can. They can hear what we would call ultrasound. Uh, elephants can hear uh, lower frequencies. They have infrasound. Uh, we're sort of in the middle. But lots of species have more acute hearing, but also hear different ranges of frequencies. Uh, our vision is pretty good. Uh, there are species, certain species of birds, that have more accurate vision. Uh, our color vision tends to be better than most animals, but it's not the best. Uh, so our senses compare to other species based on how much we depend on that sense in general. And as I've already mentioned, some senses uh, are only possessed by certain species. We don't have the ability to detect electric fields. Uh, some birds seem to have the ability to detect magnetic fields. Uh, we've already seen that uh, some animals are more sensitive to pheromones. Uh, and that's a big group. We're, we're, we're insensitive, relatively insensitive pheromone, to pheromones, uh, but that is a relatively recent evolutionary change. Uh, but there are lots of senses that other animals have that we don't. Uh, so we're going to start looking at the sense of touch, and it's a good example in lots of ways. Uh, so you have lots of sense organs built into your skin at different depths. Uh, and so we'll talk about those different sense organs. Uh, because we tend to view our sense of touch as sort of unitary, it's just one thing. Uh, but it has lots of components. Uh, but they, what they all have in common uh, is what's called a generator potential. And this is not just for touch, this is again general to senses. Uh, but our sense of touch involves different sense organs, but what they have in common uh, is that some sensory stimulus changes the voltage uh, across these sense receptor cells. And that's called a generator potential. We already know that the word potential means a difference in charge, uh, but something has to generate that difference in charge. And so that generator potential uh, is the difference in charge that occurs when a stimulus affects whatever sense organ we're looking at. So if it's a part of the skin that detects stretch, that stretch will have a generator potential. It will change the voltage across the membrane of that cell that detects stretch. Other cells, of course, don't detect stretch at all. They might detect vibration, or in other senses, light, or the presence of chemicals. But all of these things induce some sort of generator potential, some sort of difference in charge uh, across the membrane that causes an action potential. And that conversion from a stimulus to an action potential is called sensory transduction. We're getting from some form of energy or the presence of some kind of matter, a chemical, uh, to an action potential. And we've already seen action potentials. We know how those work. But we have to get from that stimulus to the action potential. And so we'll talk about how that's done for all the sensory systems. And different sensory cells, even within the sense of touch, have different specializations. Uh, some detect deep pressure. Some detect very light pressure or vibration. Some detect pain or temperature. Uh, and so we're seeing a cross-section of the skin here, uh, and we see some different components of touch. Stretch, light touch, heavy touch, pain and temperature. Uh, and so different cells have different jobs in that regard. So how does this work? How does this happen? specifically for our sense of touch. Uh, well, here's a diagram from your book, and we'll look at one particular kind of receptor cell called the Pacinian corpuscle. Uh, and so this kind of cell happens to detect uh, high-frequency vibration. And you use these to detect things like texture. As you run your fingers along a surface, uh, you can tell the difference between that surface being, for example, smooth wood, uh, versus felt, 
those have different fields. Uh, but even though we're using the same amount of pressure, our hand is moving at the same speed, it's the same temperature, we can tell the difference quite easily between something smooth and something rough because of our Puccini and corpuscles. So how does this work? Uh, well, the dendrite of these cells uh, is embedded in the multiple layers of this sort of waxy substance, kind of like myelin. Uh, it's this kind of onion-looking structure, lots and lots of layers. Uh, but r the very middle, at the core of this organ, uh, you have ion channels. And these ion channels open up when they get pulled open. They sort of have little springs that are embedded uh, in the membrane that when the membrane gets stretched out, it pulls those ion channels open. Uh, sort of like when you pull on the spring of a screen door. Uh, on a screen door, it closes the door. Uh, but you can pull that door open. Uh, and so when something, when these little springs that are attached to these doors on the ion channels get pulled, it opens up the ion channel and sodium can flow in. Just like sodium goes in when a neurotransmitter binds to certain receptors, uh, just like sodium fly, uh, flows in when a voltage-gated sodium channel is open. But here, they're being physically pulled open. It's a mechanical sense. So when vibrations stretch that membrane, it pulls the channel open physically, and you get sodium flowing in. And if you stretch that membrane enough, it will open enough of those channels and let enough sodium in to reach that threshold and generate an action potential, just like you need enough neurotransmitter to bind to receptors and get the cell body above threshold, or just like you need enough depolarization if you're stimulating something electrically, you need enough depolarization to reach threshold. Same concept here. It's just that it's stretching the membrane that's causing sodium to flow in instead of these other forms of stimulation. So that's how tr sensory transduction works uh, for Puccini and corpuscles. Mechanically opening them up. So we have sensory transduction, uh, and we know now how we get from a stimulus to an action potential, uh, but how does the strength of that stimulus matter? So how do we get from action potentials uh, to some sort of way of telling how strong a stimulus is? We can tell a stimulus is there by stretching open those channels, letting in sodium, uh, but it turns out uh, that this happens to be pressure and not vibration, uh, but if the more you press on the skin, the more action potentials are generated by these sense organs. Uh, and if you measure how hard you're pushing on the skin and also ask the person how much pressure they feel, there's a pretty good correlation. We see in these two graphs that the harder you press, first there are more action potentials the harder you press, but also the person indicates that they feel more pressure. So there's a pretty tight link between the number of action potentials being generated by the stimulus and the sensation the person perceives and what, that, and what perception they indicate is happening. Uh, but this gets us to the idea of what's called range fractionation. So sense organs have a certain range of stimulus intensity that they're good at detecting. Uh, below that intensity, they don't register it. Above that intensity, above that range, the stimulus is too intense for them to notice any difference. They're sort of maxed out. They're firing as fast as they can saying, hey, this is the strongest stimulus I can possibly tell you about. Uh, but different cells will split up the range of possible stimulus intensities. So for touch, you have different organs that respond to low frequency vibration and high frequency vibration. Uh, the range of possible vibration frequencies is too wide for any one organ to handle it all. So they split it up. So you have certain cells, we'll talk about those in a minute, uh, that detect low frequency vibration. Those Puccini and corpuscles detect high frequency vibration. So they've split up that range so that no one cell has to handle it all because they can't. Uh, so these cells are specialized for the range of the stimulus that they're good at. Uh, when it comes to vision, we'll talk about in that unit, rod cells and cone cells. Rod cells are good at, in dim conditions, low light, 
cone cells are good in bright conditions. If it's really bright outside, your rods are maxed out. They can't tell you much. If it's really dim outside, well, your cones can't tell you much. It's not bright enough. Uh, so your rods take over. So depending on how, it's, how intense the light stimulus is, you'll have different cells for handling that. Uh, depending on how high, for, how high the frequency is for vibration, you'll have different cells that handle that. So that's range fractionation. They break up the range of stimuli. So they can break up this response in terms of intensity, uh, but different kinds of receptor cells will also change their response over time. And this is called adaptation. Uh, and different cells, not all of them do this, uh, but they'll fire intensely when the stimulus first starts, but then they'll sort of get lazy. They won't fire as much, even though the stimulus hasn't changed. And you can notice this uh, in the sense of touch, for example, when you have constant pressure. So when you first put on a pair of socks, for example, you can detect that pressure. You can feel that. After a while, you don't register it anymore. You don't constantly feel the presence of those socks or any other article of clothing. You get used to it. And it's not because you have to consciously try to ignore it. We do it automatically. Your sense organs get used to the pressure of that clothing item, and so they no longer fire as much for it. Uh, this is also true in your sense of smell. So if, a, if an odor has been around for a long time, you don't detect it as intensely, or maybe not at all. Uh, you get used to the smell of your environment. Uh, and this isn't, again, because you're consciously trying to ignore it. It's not because the smell has gone away. If you leave for a while and come back, you'll notice it again. Uh, it's because that odorant, those chemicals, are always there, and your neurons get lazy. They don't need to keep telling you that that odor is there. They only tell you for something changes. So that's called adaptation. And different receptors uh, will exhibit this to different degrees. Some cells actually will keep firing at the same intensity if the stimulus is still there. Uh, we call that a tonic response. So if it keeps on firing, that's tonic. Uh, the alternative is a phasic response, uh, where the cell fires at first when the stimulus first shows up, but then gets lazy and doesn't fire as much or doesn't fire at all. Uh, so this is a figure in the lower left from your book uh, looking at some of the different cell types. So we've already seen Puccini and corpuscles. Uh, they are fast adapting. They are phasic. They fire when the vibration first starts and then stop. And they'll fire again if it stops. They'll fire again if it changes. Uh, Meisner's corpuscles respond to light touch, not deep pressure, light touch. They're also fast adapting. So they fire when that light touch first shows up and then stop. And they'll fire again uh, when that pressure goes away. Uh, things like Merkel discs or Ruffini endings, uh, which detect stretch of the skin, uh, Merkel discs detect deeper pressure, uh, these are slow adapting. They are tonic. So they keep on firing as long as that stimulus is there. And you use both of these systems. Uh, so again, it helps you ignore things that are always present, uh, but you don't always want to do that. And so you have different cells that either conserve their energy and just tell you when the changes happen, or tell you, hey, the stimulus is still out there. So you have this tonic versus phasic response. And again, this doesn't just happen in the somatosensory system. It happens in your visual system. It happens in your olfactory system. It happens in your sense of taste. You can get used to certain stimuli being there because of phasic responses. Uh, other receptor types will tell you that something is still there, and those are tonic responses. Uh, and when it comes to, and this is more specific to touch, although we'll see it's true for things like vision as well, uh, neurons have receptive fields, uh, areas of physical space that they are sensitive to. And outside of that region, they can't tell you anything. And this is most obvious for our sense of touch, which is why we're starting with touch in this unit. Uh, obviously, you have sense receptors embedded throughout your skin, but if you get uh, pressure on your arm, its sense organs 
in your arm and really in that specific part of your arm that are going to respond. Organs that are too far away don't tell you anything because that stimulus is not within their receptive field. Uh, the receptive field is the area uh, in which, if a stimulus occurs, that neuron will respond. So, for example, you can record from the brain of a cat. Uh, and if you touch its limb, you'll get a response uh, in a particular part of the brain, uh, but also in, for a particular neuron in the arm. Uh, and what's interesting is that these receptive fields are often sort of donut-shaped. Uh, so if you touch right in the middle of the receptive field, you get a very strong response from the neuron. Uh, if you touch just outside of that very central part, you'll actually get less response than if you hadn't touched anything at all or if you gave a stimulus well outside that receptive field. So they're sort of donut-shaped. And the reason that happens uh, is to get more fine spatial detection by having that area, uh, that outer part of the donut that's inhibitory, where you actually respond less. We're not going to go into the mechanics of how this works. Uh, but you actually get uh, more sensitive spatial resolution. You can tell the difference if the stimulus moves just a little bit uh, because you have what's called this on-center, off-surround, this donut-shaped receptive field. This isn't just in the cat's limb. It's also in the cat's tail, for example. Uh, but you have these shaped receptive fields where the neuron is receptive in a particular area, uh, but in a very particular shape. Now, of course, you also have the ability to detect temperature. Uh, and you do that with a, a sensory cell called a free nerve ending, uh, which also detects pain. We're not going to go into that. Uh, but we've already seen Pacini and corpuscles that detect vibration. Uh, we've seen Ruffini endings that detect stretch, uh, Merkel discs that detect touch. So this is one more kind of, it's a receptor, uh, but it goes with a certain kind of receptor cell. And these receptors respond to temperature. They are ion channels. At a certain temperature, they'll be open. At a different temperature, they'll be closed. Uh, and, I, and this figure is not from your book, but I think it's a good one. Uh, first, it illustrates another form of range fractionation. These different receptors only let in ions within a certain temperature range. And so they've split this up. You have different receptors for different temperature ranges. Uh, on the far left, you have a receptor that only opens up when it's very cold. On the far right, when it's very hot. Uh, and you have ones in the middle that detect warmth or cool sensations. Uh, what's really interesting uh, is that if you look at the top of this diagram, you see things that aren't temperature. You see food items or different plants. Uh, so on the left, you see garlic, a radish, uh, mint leaves. And if you eat one of these things, you will get a cooling sensation, especially mint. Mint is famous uh, for producing sort of a cooling sensation in the mouth. Your mouth is not actually getting colder. Uh, what's happening is that chemicals in the mint, one particular chemical, is binding to the receptor that normally indicates a cool sensation. It's sort of tricking that receptor into thinking it's cool when it actually isn't. It's just activating that receptor by a chemical means as opposed to temperature. Uh, on the far right, well, almost the far right, uh, we see uh, a chili pepper. Chili peppers contain a chemical, you may have heard of it, it's called capsaicin, uh, and that binds to a particular receptor that opens up normally uh, when it's hot, when something is hot. But this is just a chemical. It doesn't actually heat up if you eat spicy food, it does not heat up your mouth. Uh, instead, it binds to this receptor and fools that receptor into saying that it's hot. Actually, the temperature is the same. It's just that this chemical creates a sensation of heat. Uh, so we have these receptors that detect temperature, but also respond to chemicals. And that's why certain substances will feel hot or feel cool, even though the temperature has not actually changed. So we have a lot of information. We have pressure, we have stretch, we have vibration. How does all this get processed and organized in the brain? Uh, well, out in the body, your body has different zones that we call dermatomes. Uh, and each dermatome, you can see this, this figure from your book, uh, sort of look like tiger stripes on the person, uh, because if you think back to our unit on the peripheral nervous system, we have different sensory nerves that all feed into the spinal cord at different locations.
So depending on the part of the body where touch is occurring, uh, that will go to a different spinal nerve, to a different dorsal root ganglion, uh, and into the spinal cord at a different location. And so these dermatomes are sort of stripes of skin that correspond to a particular spinal nerve. Uh, so your, your, all, your, all your skin is divided up this way with different spinal nerves corresponding to different parts of the body. So spinal nerves that exit the spinal cord lower down correspond to parts like the legs uh, that are higher up the torso, even higher the neck. Uh, and so you have these dermatomes, these different zones that detect touch on different parts of the body. Uh, and what's also interesting here is that different dermatomes and different parts of a dermatome uh, will have receptive fields of different sizes. What does this mean for us? Well, that's a very practical impact. Uh, if receptive fields are very big, then if you move a stimulus within that receptive field, you can't tell a difference in location. It all seems the same to you because it's stimulating the same neuron. It's only when you move to a different neuron's receptive field that you can tell that stimulus is in a different spot. Uh, and so some parts of the body have neurons with very big receptive fields, like the back. So if a stimulus moves a couple of millimeters on your back, you can't tell. But you can tell very easily if it moves a couple of millimeters on the palm of your hand or a fingertip, because you have a lot more receptor neurons on your hand uh, you have a lot more receptive fields. The receptive fields are quite small. So a small change in location is picked up by a different neuron in the hand, whereas on the back, uh, it can handle, uh, a single neuron will handle stimulus across a wide range of locations. Uh, so this is why we tend to use our hands for fine touch, for telling details. We don't use our backs uh, because if you use your back, you only have one or a couple of neurons uh, that you can be using for a particular, for a small stimulus. Uh, whereas for your hand, you have lots and lots of receptive fields that are there. Uh, so this is, this you can tell this by what's called the two point threshold. A stimulus that actually consists of two sharp points will feel like one if both those points fall into a single receptive field. What does this mean for us? Well, it means if you take, for example, a pair of tweezers, and I encourage you to do this, a pair of tweezers, if touching the leg or the back, will feel like a single point most of the time. Uh, but that pair of tweezers obviously feels like two points in the palm of your hand. The point of the tweezers, the two points, have to be very close together before it seems like one. And that's what this diagram, not from your book, shows, that the, the bars on this diagram are the distance between the two points of those tweezers uh, for it to seem like one point. Uh, and so those, that distance is very small for the hand. You can tell between two points and one, hand, and one point for very small distances. For the back or the leg, that, that, those two points can be pretty far apart and it still seems like one. So that's what the two point threshold is the distance at which you can actually tell there are two points and not just one. Uh, we've already seen this, so I'm not going to belabor it here. Uh, but of course, we know that one side of the brain handles the opposite side of the body. We have that contralateral organization. So here we see a receptor in the hand. That signal goes up if it's, if it's for example, on the right side of the body. Uh, that receptor is on the right side. Its neuron is on the right side. It goes up the right side of the spinal cord, and then in the brain stem, it crosses over. And so from there, it travels up to the thalamus and to the left side of somatosensory cortex. Uh, so we have that crossing over in the brain stem. We already know this. I'm just reviewing it. Uh, so we have this general organizational plan, not just for the sense of touch, although that applies here, uh, but for the senses in general. So information often comes into the spinal cord. This is true for touch in particular. Uh, and then goes up to the brain stem. That's where it crosses over. And it goes to the thalamus, our sensory routing center. Our thalamus uh, is the routing center for all of our senses, except for our sense of smell. Smell goes directly to the brain, or a different part of the brain, I should say, 
Uh, other senses go through the thalamus. Uh, from there, sensory information will go to the primary sensory cortex for that sense. So for touch, it's in the parietal lobe. For vision, it's in the occipital lobe. Uh, for hearing, it is in the temporal lobe. But we have a primary sensory cortex for our various senses. That's the first part of cortex the information goes to after it goes to the thalamus. Again, accepting smell, smell is different. Uh, then there's often what's called non-primary sensory cortex. Uh, you have secondary somatosensory cortex. We're not going to go into detail there. Uh, but after primary cortex, the information goes on. It is processed further in other parts of the brain. Again, we're not going to go into detail. It's not particularly important for us. But there are other parts of cortex that do additional processing on that sensory information. So for touch, we have primary somatosensory cortex, sometimes called S1. And we've already seen this as well, but that's now we're going to go into more detail for our sense of touch. We have what's called somatotopy. Uh, if we break that word down, uh, it means that soma, parts of the body, uh, map on to different surfaces. So topy, the same word as in topography, the, the study of the surface of usually the earth. Uh, but somatotopy means that different parts of the body uh, correspond to different locations in somatosensory cortex. Uh, for example, our hands take up a lot of space in somatosensory cortex because we use our hands a lot. Uh, so they are sensitive. They have a lot of receptive fields, a lot of neurons, uh, and they are heavily represented in somatosensory cortex. Uh, things like your back or your thigh don't have big representations. You don't have a lot of neurons, a lot of receptive fields. Uh, even though there's parts of the body, in a literal sense, are big, they don't have a lot of sensitivity. They don't have a lot of neurons, a lot of receptive fields. So you don't need much of the brain to process those parts of the body. And if you look on the far right of this diagram, you see this oddly proportioned little man. Uh, and... The hands are huge, the mouth is huge, uh, because this person, this is what's called sensory homunculus, uh, which is just, which means little man, uh, is proportioned, not according to the actual size of those human body parts, obviously, uh, but is proportioned uh, according to how much representation there is in somatosensory cortex for that part of the body. So hands are heavily represented, the mouth and tongue are heavily represented, so those parts on this cartoon are represented heavily. They're bigger. And that's all that means. Uh, we should also note that these maps are also plastic, not in the material sense. They're obviously made of neurons, uh, but that they can change. So individuals that use their hands a lot and need a lot of sensitivity in their hands, with practice, the hand area of the somatosensory cortex can become even bigger. Uh, if you play a stringed instrument, odds are, you, if you are right-handed, uh, that you hold the strings down with your left hand. So the corresponding part of somatos somatosensory cortex, that corresponding to your left hand, tends to be bigger with a lot of practice. Uh, you don't actually lose the nearby parts of your body in terms of sensation. Uh, it's not as though you can't, people that play stringed instruments can't feel their left arm as well. We don't know how that works exactly, but the hand is more sensitive without losing sensitivity of other body parts. Uh, if a part of the body is lost, the, the neighboring areas of somatosensory cortex will take over because sensations aren't occurring for that body part anymore. It's missing. You can get phantom limb pain. We're not going to go into detail there. Uh, you can still get sensation for a body part that isn't there uh, due to firing of neurons in that area. Obviously, the body part itself cannot be stimulated. It's gone. Uh, but you can get nearby areas taking over a body part that is, whose representation is no longer active in somatosensory cortex. So they're plastic in both ways. You can get an area getting bigger, or you can get an area getting smaller through disuse. Okay, that will do it for our unit on the senses in general uh, and our sense of touch in particular. So we, see, we saw why we have senses to detect our environment, and we went over an overview of the basic types. And hopefully you learned that there are more than just five senses.
Obviously, there are also senses that we don't have. Uh, and we went over how sensory transduction works, how we get from uh, a stimulus in the environment to action potentials, and how stimulus intensity tracks with more action potentials, and also perception of how strong that stimulus is. We saw concepts like range fractionation. Uh, and we saw how the somatosensory system in particular is organized. But we also saw a layout for the senses in general. You have sensory information going to the spinal cord, through the thalamus, uh, going up to primary sensory cortex. And we'll see that theme again and again as we go through the senses. Okay, so for next time, obviously, this is an online video, take the online quiz. Uh, read the next chapter, do the next reading, uh, and we're going to stick with our unit on the senses, and next time we'll talk about hearing, smell, and taste. Uh, so we've done our overview of the senses, we'll talk about a few. Uh, the time after that, we'll talk about vision. Uh, and as always, do the reading before lecture. Uh, that's going to help you absorb the material. Uh, and with that in mind, uh, again, our next unit will be on hearing, smell, and taste. After that, we will do vision. We're going to work our way through the senses. Uh, and as we go through these units, hopefully this content is now relating back to our units on action potentials, on synaptic transmission, on the structure of the brain. So we're really going to start building uh, on that more biological content that we went over uh, earlier in the class. Uh, so I will see you next time.